three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode invasion of the miracle snatchers on the last episode of radio free mormon i talked among other things about a certain miracle that has gained some currency in the lds church involving wilford woodruff i have done some further research on that particular miracle in the last week and i want to share the results of that research with you today because i find it absolutely fascinating And the reason I find it fascinating is because this particular miracle story has gone through a number of permutations. We begin with the miracle story of Wilfred Woodruff and the oak tree, the falling oak tree, if you recall, as it is presented in church materials today. For instance, in the LDS publication, Teachings of Presidents of the Church, the volume devoted to Wilfred Woodruff, we find this in chapter 5 under the title, The Holy Ghost and personal revelation. This is available on the church website right now, and I'm reading it from the church website right now. It talks about the importance of obtaining the Holy Ghost in one's personal life, and it leads into the story by saying, his brethren, i.e. President Woodruff's brethren, knew him as a man susceptible to the impressions of the Spirit of the Lord, a man guided by inspiration in the performance of his duty far more than by any gift of wisdom or of judgment that he himself possessed. It goes on, President Woodruff often related an experience he had with the impressions of the Spirit. It occurred as he and his family traveled to the eastern United States, where he had been called to serve a mission. He said, and now here's the quote from the story as we typically hear it today in church, I drove my carriage one evening into the yard of Brother Williams, who was a local member of the church. That part is added to the story, so we'll know who he's talking about. I drove my carriage one evening into the yard of Brother Williams. Brother Orson Hyde drove a wagon by the side of mine. I had my wife and children in the carriage. So Orson Hyde is driving a wagon. Wilford Woodruff is driving a carriage. And in the carriage are his wife and children. This will become important later. He goes on. After I turned out my team and had my supper, I went to bed in the carriage. I had not been there but a few minutes when the Spirit said to me, Get up and move that carriage. I told my wife I had to get up and move the carriage. She said, What for? I said, I don't know. That is all she asked me on such occasions. When I told her I did not know, that was enough. I got up and moved my carriage. I then looked around me and went to bed. The same Spirit said, Go and move your animals from that oak tree. I went and moved my horses and put them in a little hickory grove. I again went to bed. So, two revelations from the Spirit to Wilfred Woodruff this night. First, move your carriage and your family away from the oak tree. And then the second revelation from the Spirit is, do the same thing for your animals. Get them away from that oak tree. As he says, I went and moved my horses and put them in a little hickory grove. I again went to bed. Then... In 30 minutes, he says, in 30 minutes, a whirlwind came up and broke that oak tree off within two feet from the ground. So it snapped that oak tree completely off at the trunk, just two feet from the ground. It swept over three or four fences and fell square in that dooryard near Brother Orson Hyde's wagon and right where mine had stood. What would have been the consequences if I had not listened to that spirit? Why, myself and wife and children doubtless would have been killed. That was the still, small voice to me. No earthquake, no thunder, no lightning. Well, there was a whirlwind, but no lightning. But the still, small voice of the Spirit of God. It saved my life. It was the spirit of revelation to me. And this is how we hear this story in church periodicals today. When we look at the reference provided for that story, we come up with the Deseret Weekly, September 5th, 1891, page 323. So this story is published in 1891, which would have been some decades after this event took place. Now, the way it is published here, there is no year or date given for when this incident was supposed to have taken place. But having done a little research on the subject, I found out that the date is July 5th, 1848. That's July 5th, 1848. Of course, Wilfred Woodruff is more famous probably than anyone else in the church 
for having kept journals. The journals of Wilfred Woodruff are an amazing source of information for history about the early church because he kept a meticulous journal for many, many years and decades. It appears he kept those journals from 1828 to 1898, a period of 70 years. And those journals can be found on the church website under the church history catalog. The first thing I learned from perusing Wilfred Woodruff's journals is that this incident happened on July 5th, 1848. The account I just read does not give a year or a date, but his journals do. So knowing that this event happened in 1848, and also knowing that that story I just read from the teachings of the presidents of the church was published in 1891, we realized that more than 40 years transpired between the event itself and the date that story was published. The second thing that I notice is that when I read this journal entry for July 5th, 1848, where Wilford Woodruff describes contemporaneously with the event what happened, it is much less miraculous than it ends up being when it's recounted four decades later. In fact, there is very little of the miraculous in this story. It's certainly a close call, but it's more common sense than anything miraculous. Let me read this to you as it is found in Wilfred Woodruff's journal. Here's the entry for July 5th, 1848. It starts with a little sketch, or perhaps we would call it a doodle, of what looks like a tree on its side. It's hard to tell, but I'm guessing that's what it is because that's what the story is about. Wilfred Woodruff is somewhat famous for drawing these little doodles or pictures at the beginning of certain journal entries. And this journal entry is no exception. So we start with the doodle and then it goes on with the language. We drove 15 miles to Brother James William. We spent the afternoon and night with Brother Williams and had an interview with Brother Samuel Miller during the evening. Now we get to the interesting part. A hard thunderstorm was approaching us. So the first thing I notice here is that we don't really need a special voice of God to tell Wilford Woodruff to move his carriage and his animals out from under a tree because he sees on the horizon that a hard thunderstorm was approaching us. Now, anybody who spent any time outdoors in the Midwest or the South or where storms are big and frequent knows that if you've got a big storm coming, the last place you want to be is under a tree. I was raised as a kid in Texas, and I remember getting some safety tips from my dad at an early age. And one of those safety tips was that if a storm comes up, you don't want to be under a tree. Number one, if there's lightning in the storm, that lightning is going to go to the tree, and if you're under it, bad things will happen. Better for you to be out in a ditch somewhere or at the lowest level of land possible to avoid the lightning. If you go to where a tree is, you're going to where the lightning is likely to strike. And the second reason is like unto it, because if that storm has a lot of wind to it, oak trees, which are famous for not bending with the wind, may have limbs broken off or the entire tree fall over. And if you are under that oak tree, bad things are going to happen to you. So best to stay away from big trees in a storm. Everybody knows that. I knew that as a kid in Texas. So when Wilford Woodruff sees a hard thunderstorm approaching, he does the very common sense, reasonable thing that anybody would do under the circumstances. He goes on in his journal. A hard thunderstorm was approaching us. My mules were tied to a large oak tree on the opposite side of the street. I felt impressed to move my mules away to another place. Well, he doesn't really need God to tell him, and he doesn't actually say that God tells him. He just says he felt impressed to move his mules away from the oak tree. I would have felt impressed to do the same thing under the same circumstances, and you probably would have too. I felt impressed to move my mules away to another place. I did so. I also removed my children out of the carriage and made them a bed in the house. I also moved my carriage one rod down to the house in which Mrs. Woodruff, myself, and one child slept. So here we get the additional details that the family is no longer going to be sleeping in the carriage. Because the storm is approaching, Wilfred Woodruff is going to have his wife and children sleep inside. It appears that they were in two different houses, but nevertheless, everybody's inside and hopefully safe from the storm that's approaching. He goes on, we had just retired to bed. When the storm reached us with great fury, in a moment, the large oak tree came thundering to the ground with a mighty crash. Had I not have moved my mules, it probably 
would have killed them. Had I not have moved my carriage, it would have crushed it to atoms and killed us dead. For the body of the tree fell where my carriage stood and just missed Brother Kingsley's wagon. Wait a second. What about Orson Hyde's wagon? I thought it was Orson Hyde's wagon in the 1891 account. Actually, it was Orson Hyde's wagon in the 1891 account that this tree barely misses. But here in the journal, it is not Orson Hyde at all. It's Brother Kingsley's wagon. He's another brother who's traveling with them. But in the later account, Brother Kingsley gets upgraded, presumably, to Brother Orson Hyde. Once again, his journal entry says that the body of the tree fell where my carriage stood and just missed Brother Kingsley's wagon. I considered it an interposition of providence to save our lives. Period. End of journal entry for July 5th, 1848. You can see what I mean when I say this is much more modest when it comes to talking about the miraculous nature of this event. The contemporaneous account in his journal has Wilfred Woodruff seeing the storm coming and taking the reasonable action of moving his mules away from the tree and moving his family out of the carriage and into a house. Later, perhaps unsurprisingly, that storm does hit, it knocks over the oak tree, and it's a good thing that Wilfred Woodruff took the steps that he did both for his mules and for his family, because his action appears to have saved their lives. But notice something else. He never says that the voice of the Spirit tells him to first move his family away and second to move his animals away. All he says is, I felt impressed to move my mules away to another place. I did so. I also removed my children out of the carriage and made them a bed in the house. And by way of clarification here, it appears he has multiple children with him. Most of the children go into the house of Brother Williams. And there's another house further down where Wilfred Woodruff, his wife, and one child spend the night. But they are inside, out of the rain, and out of the path of the crashing oak tree. Once again, Wilfred Woodruff in his journal never says anything about the voice of the Spirit or a revelation from God. He simply says that upon seeing a thunderstorm approaching, I felt impressed to move my mules away. Well, I would have felt impressed to move my mules away too if I saw a thunderstorm approaching. And even though Wilfred Woodruff concludes his journal entry saying, I considered it an interposition of providence to save our lives, yeah, I can understand why he would, even though everything that happened could have happened quite reasonably without any interposition of providence. He was a religious man. He would, of course, see this in a religious way. The thing that's interesting is that over the course of 40 years, this otherwise mundane series of events, and by mundane, I mean completely reasonable and rational without any divine interposition, gets transformed into not just one revelation from God, but two revelations of God. One for the family, the second one for the animals. Even though interestingly, in the actual journal, the first thing he moves are the animals and the second thing is his family and so we see how an ordinary occurrence when it happens gets transformed over time into something absolutely miraculous now in the journal entry wilford woodruff says the animals are his mules 40 years later he says the animals he moves are his horses that's the kind of change in detail that one would expect in recollecting an event 40 years previous. What I find more interesting is that in the journal, the tree barely misses Brother Kingsley's wagon, whereas when he recalls it 40 years later, it's Brother Orson Hyde's wagon that the tree barely misses. And of course, as we have seen, this event becomes imbued with miraculous revelation to save Wilford Woodruff and his family and his mules. But it doesn't stop there because a listener to the show contacted me and said that she had an ancestor who was also present in this company of missionaries traveling with Wilfred Woodruff and Orson Hyde to the East Coast. And this ancestor's name was Charles Root Dana. That's his full name, Charles Root, R-O-O-T, last name Dana, D-A-N-A. The listener who sent this to me is Meredith Malan, or M-A-L-A-N. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm using the name with permission from Meredith. And it was Meredith who sent me a copy of the relevant section of Charles Root Dana's journal for, guess what, July 5th, 1848. 
I want to say that this journal is not in handwriting, it is typed, so this is not the original journal. At some point along the way, somebody took it upon themselves, thank goodness actually, to type it out so it's easier to read. Every effort was apparently made in order to type it the way that Charles Root Dana wrote it down. And this is not actually his journal. This is taken from his journal. What Charles Dana says is that he was asked by George A. Smith to write an abridgment of his journal in 1859, which would have been 11 years after the date of the incident in question. So it could be used for church historical purposes. But it does appear that Charles Dana used his journal for purposes of making this abridgment. Now, I had never heard of Charles R. Dana before. But looking him up on the internet, I find that he was indeed a member of the church. He was baptized into the LDS church in 1838. In 1840, he was serving as a missionary in Boonville, New York for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then in 1842 to 43, he was a missionary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Charles Dana was also a judge of the municipal court at Nauvoo, Illinois. He was a friend of Joseph Smith and wrote of an experience where Joseph Smith healed Charles Dana's wife when she was seriously ill. Charles Dana was a mason by trade and helped complete the Nauvoo Temple after Joseph Smith's death. In the completed temple, Charles Dana married two additional wives in 1846. He was also significant in making political connections for the Latter-day Saints with important individuals such as Thomas L. Kane in Philadelphia and Duff Green in Washington, D.C. So that's enough background on Charles Dana. Let's get to what Charles Dana wrote in his journal for July 5th, 1848, and how it is that he recounts this experience. If you thought there were differences between Wilfred Woodruff's journal account and the story in the Deseret Weekly 40 years later, you haven't seen anything yet. Here's what Charles Dana says. Elder Woodruff and the rest of us started on our journey together and continued day after day until we arrived at Keokuk. I will, however, relate a remarkable circumstance which happened on Wednesday the 5th. We drove 10 miles this day and put up at the house, or rather in the dooryard of Brother James Williams. See, we've got the same Brother Williams, we've got the same dooryard, we've got the same date, we've got everything the same. This is the same incident that he's describing, as will become apparent shortly. As soon as we stopped, I noticed a large black oak tree standing just over but close to the fence to the north of us. It struck me in a moment that evil was determined, but I said nothing about it until we had turned our animals out to graze. So this oak tree to Charles Dana is like the tree in the backyard of the house in Poltergeist. It just looks evil to Charles Dana. He's got a bad feeling about this, but I said nothing about it until we had turned our animals out to graze. Then, while we were standing talking near the vehicles, which would be the wagons and the carriages, I mustered my feelings and spoke as follows. Brethren, I would like to have these vehicles moved. The brethren seemed astonished and said, What for, Brother Dana? What for? I don't like the looks of that tree there, said I. Oh, I guess there is no danger, Brother Dana. No danger, which is what they said back to him. In other words, they are poo-pooing his feeling that this oak tree is evil and that they should move their vehicles. And apparently, Wilfred Woodruff was among the company poo-pooing this feeling from Charles Dana. He goes on, This was said with such a look and smile that I was convinced, as I feared that they would, that they looked upon me as being old womanish or whimsical. Consequently, my feelings were much hurt. But I pondered in my heart the impressions made, and notwithstanding my feelings, for I hated to be looked upon as a whimsical old granny, well, who doesn't? I sought an other opportunity to exhort them to move the vehicles. Such an opportunity offered about the middle of the afternoon. And I again said, but with more emphasis, brethren, I would like to have these vehicles moved. And the response, of course, comes, what for, brother Dana? What for? Was again the question asked. I answered as above, I don't like that tree there. Oh, I guess there is no danger, Brother Dana, no danger, was again reiterated in my ears and with the same kind of a smile, only more so. So here, Charles Dana says that he's the one who has the bad feelings about this tree and he's the one who's requesting that the vehicles be moved away from the tree, but nobody in the company will listen to him. He tells them once they don't listen, he tells them twice they don't listen, and if we know our miracle stories, we can bet what's going to happen next. 
even though it's completely different from what Wilford Woodruff says in either his journal or in his account 40 years later. Charles Dana goes on, I was again very much annoyed and the temptation was, never mind if they will not move their vehicles, let them suffer the consequence. But I would not cherish such a feeling in my heart because I was fully convinced that the lives of my brethren were in jeopardy. I cannot describe my feelings, all the balance of the afternoon and evening. I was perfectly miserable. The reader may wonder why I did not move them myself. I could have done so, but this to me would have looked like obstinacy or meddling with other people's business. So now Charles Dana starts taking some measurements of the tree and how far it would go if it fell over. He goes on, the very place where the top of the tree was to lay, I had marked out in my mind. What to do, I hardly knew. However, I watched a favorable opportunity to speak to Elder Woodruff alone. So he figures, if I can get Elder Woodruff away from the group, maybe I can talk some sense to this guy. Because nobody's having any of it so far. Such a chance did not offer until about 9 o'clock in the evening. Prayers were attended in Brother William's house. Elder Woodruff was mouth. As soon as he arose from his knees, he took his hat and made for the door. This was just what I desired in my heart. I made haste and got my hat and followed hard after him. And as soon as I could, I was at his side. And with a good deal of emphasis and feeling, I said, Elder Woodruff, I would like to have those vehicles moved. He looked at me very inquisitively and said, Do you feel that way, Elder Dana? I do, Elder Woodruff, was my reply. And my heart leaped for joy as he uttered those words, for I believed that I should now gain my point. He answered, we will move them then. So finally, the third time getting Elder Woodruff alone, Charles Dane is able to convince him that they need to move the freaking vehicles. So Wilford Woodruff answers, we will move them then, and then they take action. I took hold of the tongue of his carriage, and he pushed behind, and we moved it perhaps 30 or 40 feet. It was rather dark, so that in moving it, the forward wheels struck the bottom log of the house that was longer than the rest. So they're moving it up against the house. When it stopped, he asked me, there, Brother Dana, will that do? It almost sounds like Wilfred Woodruff is trying to humor him at this point, but at least he's moving the vehicles. That's the important thing. There, Brother Dana, will that do? I looked up, and although it was dark, I could see the top of the tree, as there was clear sky in that direction. I answered, yes, Elder Woodruff, I think it may just about do. The fear then measurably left me. However, I observed I would like to have had the wagon moved, but Henry was gone and got to bed. But really, I did not feel so much concern about the wagon as I did about your carriage. Brother Woodruff and family went to bed, as I suppose, in the carriage. I went to the wagon and lay down by the side of Henry, but I was timid and anxiously waiting and listening for the wind that was to prostrate that tree. So, he knows this is coming. He doesn't see it coming according to his account, but he knows from earlier that day that there's going to be a problem with that tree and it's going to fall over. And the only reason a tree would fall over is because of a big wind. So he's listening for the wind as he's laying in the wagon with Henry. I did not have to wait, I think more than about 20 minutes before I heard a tremendous wind in the right direction to bring that tree down upon us. I began to hustle up and Henry asked me, what are you going to do? I am going into the house, was my reply. What for, said he. Do you not hear that wind, said I. He lifted up his head and listened. My sakes, I do. And I am going in too, said he. We gathered our coats and vests, hurried into the house, and the wind struck the house, and the same instant the tree came down with a tremendous crash, covering completely the whole space where Brother Woodruff's carriage had stood, but a very few minutes before. Some of the top boughs brushed the back part of Elder Woodruff's carriage. He got up, came into the house, lifted up his hands and said, Elder Dana, that was revelation. The body of the tree fell within about one or one and a half feet of the ends of the axle trees of Henry's wagon. So that's how he recounts the incident. And yet in his journal, this was such an impressive event to Charles Dana that he ponders about it after the event. Here's what he says. I always looked upon that as a very remarkable interposition of providence. Interestingly, the same phrase that Wilfred Woodruff uses in his journal 
account, the interposition of providence. Remember, I always looked upon that. This is Charles Dana. I always looked upon that as a very remarkable interposition of providence and never should have felt clear of the guilt of negligence if I had ceased my supplications and suffered the enemy to have prevailed. For the whole of them would have been mashed all to pieces if the carriage had not been moved. He concludes with this poignant thought. Some may wonder why I received the revelation instead of Elder Woodruff. Well, Elder Woodruff is going to take care of that in about 40 years, Charles Dana, so don't you worry. Some may wonder why I received the revelation instead of Elder Woodruff. I can attribute it only to one fact, and that is there was an envious feeling against me at Pisgah, which is a location along the trail, against me at Pisgah among a share of the means that I had gathered. Now, what they're doing on this mission is they're trying to gather means to help out the Mormons who are traveling west. And when Charles Dana says means, he presumably is referring to the money and supplies that they are trying to gather from saints and other interested parties in order to assist the saints in moving out to the Great Salt Lake. And it sounds like there was some question among the other brethren as to whether Charles Dana had perhaps been skimming off the top. He goes on. And while Brother Woodruff was at Pisgah saying the least of it, he was in the neighborhood where he could get his head filled with tails. So Charles Dana is speculating that the reason he received this revelation instead of Brother Woodruff is because Brother Woodruff had heard tales about things that Charles Dana was doing with the means he was gathering, which were not according to Hoyle, but which Charles Dana denies having done. So rumors about bad things that Charles Dana was doing were likely heard by Brother Woodruff, even though Charles Dana denies that they were true. And he concludes... I do believe to this day that the Lord gave me this revelation to manifest to Brother Woodruff that my hands were clean of that charge. So now you can see what I mean when I say that Charles Dana's journal recounts a very different sequence of events from that mentioned in the story told by Elder Woodruff some 40 years later. But really, if we look at Elder Woodruff's journal entry and compare it to Charles Dana's journal entry, they don't really contradict that much because once again, when Wilford Woodruff recounts the story in his journal, all he says is, I felt impressed to move my mules away. He doesn't say why he was impressed. He doesn't say who or what impressed him. And so therefore, what Wilford Woodruff writes is in that way at least consistent with what Charles Dana writes, if we allow for the fact that it was Charles Dana who was the one who impressed Wilfred Woodruff to move his mules away from the tree. Remember, in his journal entry, Wilfred Woodruff says nothing about the Spirit of God telling him. He just says, I felt impressed. It's not until 40 years later, when he's recounting this story again, that he's going to receive two direct commands from the Spirit of the Lord, first to move his family, then to move his animals, with no mention whatsoever of Charles Dana. So I call this episode Invasion of the Miracle Snatchers because it appears that what may have happened here is that Charles Dana receives a revelation to move the vehicles away from the tree. He tells the brethren about it, including Wilford Woodruff, not once but twice and gets poo-pooed for his efforts until finally he gets Wilford Woodruff alone and manages to impress upon him that he's freaking serious about moving the vehicles away from that tree. And he gets Wilford Woodruff to move his carriage away from the tree they go inside the house, boom, the wind comes, knocks the tree down, and Brother Wilfred Woodruff is saved. Not by the revelation Wilfred Woodruff received from the Lord, but by the impression of the evil-looking oak tree that Charles Dana received and was finally able to convince Wilfred Woodruff of how important it really was to move his carriage away from the tree. Now, at this point in time, I can't tell you which of these accounts is correct. At a minimum, what I can tell you is that Wilfred Woodruff's journal records something that is decidedly unmiraculous. Forty years later, it becomes quite miraculous in a retelling by Wilfred Woodruff. And on top of that, in Charles Dana's journal, he goes into great detail to talk about his impressions and how it was that he was the one who finally got Wilfred Woodruff to move his carriage and in fact helped him move his carriage once he convinced Wilfred Woodruff to do so. And a likely interpretation of this is that this really was the impression that Charles Dana received that he finally convinced Wilfred Woodruff of and that 40 years later, Wilfred Woodruff has now consciously or subconsciously co-opted this miracle from Charles Dana and now applies it to himself. He's the one who received the revelation, not Charles Dana, not anyone else. Charles Dana is now forgotten. And indeed, Charles Dana died August 7th of 18. 
68. So it is decades since Charles Dana has passed away when Wilford Woodruff is publishing this account in 1891 in the Deseret Weekly. So at least he doesn't have to worry about offending Charles Dana by taking credit for the revelation that Charles Dana wrote that he himself was the one to receive and not Wilford Woodruff. Dead men tell no tales. And though this timing may simply be coincidental, it has to be observed that it's always a good thing if you're going to tell a contradictory story to somebody else like this, it's best to wait until after they're dead and buried so they can't contradict you. A lesson Paul H. Dunn learned to his detriment and heartbreak. Now this whole idea of appropriating someone else's miracle story and applying it to yourself has a very long pedigree. It's been going on a long time and especially when the miracle happens to somebody who is not as important as the person to whom this miracle gets ascribed in later retellings. A classic example of this is perhaps the most famous story in the Old Testament, the story of David killing Goliath. And the question then becomes, was it David who killed Goliath or was it somebody else, someone who was nowhere near as famous as David, somebody named Elhanan? And this is a famous chestnut in the Old Testament because there actually appear to be two separate accounts of somebody named Goliath getting killed. The famous and detailed one is where David kills him. The second not so detailed one and the one that typically gets overlooked has to do with a person named Elhanan killing Goliath. I found a good article on this on the internet at the website called Got Questions and it's under the title Who Killed Goliath, David or Elhanan? Here's the answer they give. The record of Goliath's defeat at the hand of David is found in 1 Samuel 17. However, a verse in 2 Samuel seems to name Elhanan instead of David as the one who toppled Goliath. Here's what's clear. 1 Samuel 17 verse 50 says that David killed Goliath. Here's what's not so clear. In some translations, 2 Samuel 21 verse 19 seems to indicate that it was Elhanan, not David, who killed the giant. And here's what it says there. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jareorjim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Remember that description of his spear being like a weaver's beam? We get that in the David story too. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 19, it says that it was Elhanan who struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. The article goes on. The size of Goliath's spear shaft is a detail shared by both passages. Yes, I just mentioned that. The obvious difference is who killed Goliath. Was it David or Elhanan? Unless David and Elhanan are different names for the same person, or there were two giants named Goliath, these verses seem to contradict each other. But then in 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5, we find an account that appears to try and solve this discrepancy. 1 Chronicles 20 verse 5 says, In another battle with the Philistines, Elhanan, son of Jair, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. This verse repeats the detail of the size of the spear shaft, and it clearly says that Elhanan killed Goliath's brother rather than Goliath himself. So without going into this textual discrepancy any further, because it's beyond the scope of this podcast, what we seem to have in the Old Testament and what many Bible scholars agree is that there was a lesser known person named Elhanan who actually killed a very big guy named Goliath. But later on over the course of time, it was decided that such a miraculous event shouldn't be wasted on somebody of no importance, but should instead be ascribed to David. So instead of Elhanan killing Goliath, it becomes David killing Goliath. In the same way, we may have a latter-day instance of the same thing with this story of the falling oak tree. It actually may be Charles Dana who received the revelation or the impression that they need to move their carriages and animals away from this oak tree because it's going to fall in the night in a huge windstorm. And Charles Dana tries to convince everybody, including Wilford Woodruff, to move their vehicles and nobody's buying it until he finally gets Wilford Woodruff alone on the third try later that very night, about nine o'clock, later that very night, and finally convinces Wilford Woodruff to move his carriage. He moves his carriage, the thunderstorm comes down, the oak tree falls over, boom, Wilfred Woodruff 
and his carriage are saved because of the revelation or impression to Charles Dana. But who's Charles Dana? I've never heard of Charles Dana, not before I got contacted by this listener with a copy of his journal. And so it is possible that over time, this miracle that happens to a relatively unimportant person in church history now gets ascribed to Wilfred Woodruff, the fourth president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because really, that's who should be receiving this revelation anyway, not Charles Dana. And so we see that when it comes to writing religious histories, there may indeed be nothing new under the sun. And if we can see the invasion of the miracle snatchers happening in the Old Testament with the story of David killing Goliath, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised to see the same kind of miracle snatchers appearing again in Latter-day Saint history. Well, that's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.